All right, so uh, good afternoon. My name is Garrett Casey. I am the regional sales manager for McAfee. Uh, our speaker today actually had to bug out earlier. His name is Will, so if you dropped by our booth earlier today, Will had a family issue, so he had to uh, depart. So I appreciate your time and attendance today to talk a little bit about CASB. So I'm based here in Raleigh, incidentally. And so I'm, I don't know anybody in the room here today, so a lot of new faces, but um, how many know what a CASB is? All right. What's a CASB? Absolutely. What's it do? Pardon me? Like a firewall for child stuff? Yep, absolutely. Well, not really a firewall. Yeah. Um, so my personal journey to a CASB is uh, prior to being at McAfee, I worked for a company called Sky High Networks. So Sky High Networks was acquired by McAfee in January of this year. And I've got a little bit of a time to, to kind of bring you to how I got there. But the journey of a CASB for me was I had a customer up in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, they were a work for Checkpoint software at the time. And they were looking at their log data. They were a defense department contractor. And they had data being exfiltrated and data being shared that wasn't supposed to be shared. So they had a solution inside of Office 365 at the time it was called Sky High Networks um, that was able to determine who the users were, the uploads, the downloads, the type of documents that they were trying to transfer, and whether those documents were permitted to transfer or permitted to uh, be quarantined or tombstones. And so they were looking at a CASB to provide that data analytics and security in the cloud. So if you're familiar with how many folks have built an on-prem network DLP? So it takes a while. It takes anywhere from two to three years to have a really good on-prem DLP. Now as we migrate to the cloud, how many cloud service providers do you think that are out there today? So all of, how, many, how many apps do you have on your phone? A lot, right? So we catalog over 30,000 cloud solution providers. Incidentally, we catalog over 4,000 file sharing solutions. So if you can imagine, I'm sharing a file or files with a variety of different services. What happens to those documents when I share it? So people look for a CASB to provide intel into where people are sharing this particular data. If the data gets there, what happens to the intellectual property of that data? Is the data encrypted at risk? Risk. So people look to a CASB to provide um, those analytics and risk associated with providing or providing data to those particular services. So. This particular contractor was looking for data that was being exfiltrated out of the United States into, um, into Europe. And so they were utilizing a CASB to provide that visibility. Once again, the data moving without actually going through an on-prem network type DLP, but actually traversing the cloud. And so that's essentially what a CASB is. Um, we allow businesses to, or a CASB allows businesses to accelerate uh, the business, giving them total control over the data in the cloud. Gartner, incidentally, says that through 2020, 99% of cloud security failures will be the customer's fault. So what they're really meaning about that is, as you take your data and put it in somebody else's data center, who owns the data, how's the data secured? A lot of folks come to us and say, hey, I, I'm in Amazon and it's secure. Well, not really. You're still responsible for the security inside of Amazon. You're still responsible for the security inside of Azure, unless you subscribe to a particular service to secure that data, like it has been. So they're essentially moving forward. It's, it's going to be a, a pretty much CASB is going to be a required event for you doing things in the cloud. So this tells you a little bit about our organization and how we got here. Um, Sky High was founded back in 2012. We're actually the pioneer of the CASB. We came to the market with a solution called um, Shadow IT. And so providing visibility into the cloud, so what type of services were people utilizing in the network. Um, we introduced a service for API connectivity in the sales force. So a real good example of this is call it customers um, reutilizing Salesforce to support their customer service. And so as their users were calling in, the customer service agents were taking the credit card information and sticking it in the optional field inside of Salesforce. What that means is when that person called back, they already have their credit card information there. The danger of that is that you have unencrypted credit card information sitting into in a software as a service type product that could be visible to folks you know, doing something malicious internally at Salesforce. So they looked to us providing the control. So as that 
customer service agent put that credit card number into that field inside of Salesforce to encrypt it. So that's what folks will look as a good use case for a CASB is encrypting data inside of a service such as ServiceNow or Salesforce to give you a good example. Um, how many here are cloud last? You know what that term is? I go to organizations all the time and I say, what, what's your cloud exposure? Oh, we're not in the cloud. So your cloud last. Yep. Do you have Salesforce? Yeah, we got Salesforce. You have service now? Yep, we got service now. Is that on-prem? No, it's off-prem. All right, how do you secure it? How do you, how do you secure Workday? How many of you have Workday? Uh, oh, we're not in the cloud, but we have Workday. So you do have exposure to the cloud. You do have people putting information into the cloud. And how they secure the data, they look to a CASB to, to secure that data. So once again, we were acquired by McAfee in January of this year. Um, I'm going to flip through here. These are the services of the customers that we service on a day-to-day -day basis. It, as you can well imagine, it's growing. We're at about 30% for 30 of the Fortune 100. But this is an interesting um, slide. You've got Forrester to the right, IDC, and then Gartner. Forrester being the oldest. So CASB has been around since 2012. There's a variety of different players in the market. You'll notice that a lot of the names going from right to left have changed. They've either been gone out of business or they've been acquired. So, if you look to McAfee or look to Sky High Networks and the Gartner, that was done in December of 2017. Sky High would be replaced by McAfee. So a lot of vendors to the right, and then you can see as you go further and further to the left, a lot of consolidation. So you're seeing other companies get into the CASB game, other security products, um, other vendors getting into cloud access security broker technologies. So you'll hear from us. When you talk CASB, you'll talk about sanctioned services. So sanctioned services are those services that are sanctioned by their organization. So how many folks have a sanctioned Office 365 account? And licensed by the organization using services such as Mail, SharePoint, OneDrive. You also have sanctioned services such as Salesforce, ServiceNow. So those are the, the services that the organization is licensed to provide. You also have what's called our shadow services. How many folks have a personal Dropbox account? A personal box account, a personal share file account. So these are the services that are unsanctioned by the organization. So when we go in and talk to folks, we specifically we talk to folks about Cloud Last, we talk about the services that are sanctioned, such as those of Salesforce, ServiceNow, um, Workday, Office 365, and then we get into these other services that are unsanctioned. So we usually find about two to three X. So I go into an organization and they say, well, we might have about a thousand cloud solution providers that people are using. And they range from all different types of apps, but we usually find two to three apps. Um, how many have ever used a PDF Word conversion product? App on your phone, and you can convert this to a PDF and send it over to somebody. You find a lot of those. Unfortunately, a lot of those types of services, the intellectual property of that document is now owned by the service provider that converted it. So that's a real good example of why people look to a CASB, is preventing that type of document from getting there in the first place. The third time is around custom apps. So as AWS and Azure have exploded, people have taken services that they built in-house, and for economies of scale, they've moved those services from in-house up to AWS or up into um, Azure or Google Cloud, for instance. And so they're looking for a casby looking feel to those custom apps that they develop internally. So that's another very good use case is providing CASB to a custom-owned or homegrown app. So as you know, all of these services have a tendency to be connected in some way, shape, or form, whether a user is at home or whether a user is traversing a VPN or whether a user is on network. And we've got employees, partners, customers, and vendors uh, connecting either through managed or unmanaged use cases. So a CASB is a single point of control. So the same place, same time, I can apply a DLP policy, for instance, across services like Box, Dropbox, Salesforce, and OneDrive. We, we talked to a customer, I've got a customer up in Richmond, Virginia. They have 19 cloud apps that are considered important to their business. They have 19 different security products, 19 different DLP policies, and 19 methods of reporting for those particular apps. But they came to us and said, can you help us with some of them? So we were able to help a CASB to apply to eight of those. And then the other two are in the custom app arena, which we're, which we're working to uh, providing them connectivity from a CASB perspective. But we can provide the user behavior and analytics. And that's important to a CASB is where people are going, how often they're going there, what are the services they're uploading or they're downloading, um, 
are they sharing files internally or externally? And so being able to apply DLP policies is also important in that particular scenario. But that's typically what people are looking for a CASB to do. Any questions? Sure. So it, I feel you reference DLP a lot. Yeah. We use most time web sense for DLP kind of cloud stop people from doing things like boss and Dropbox. Yeah. We just replace that with a bottle from that. Um so it really depends. So from a shadow IT visibility perspective, you can utilize a CAD to, to connect to the existing web sense from a proxy perspective. But if, as long as you have you know, some controls as to where people are going and what they're doing in the services, Force Point, I think, has a CASB product. Yeah, that would be part of what sense, yeah. Yeah, so they've got a CASB product, so they're able to provide some visibility into the cloud services that folks are using. So yeah. that would be more of a, a vendor kind of who does yeah. what, where, when, and how, and I, I don't want to get into that kind okay. of discussion. But if you're using a CASB like that or a product like that, that's fantastic. And the other question was, is can the data that you guys provide as to where people are going are your customers then downloading that data into something that like a small analytics? You can. Hey, sorry, profile, who's the things that maybe is concerned because Mary's going here and sharing this doesn't want to do that? Yeah, so that's also important. So when you think about um, the amount of analytics, especially in a very, very large organization, so we have some customers that are 400,000 people. So if you can imagine trying to figure out who's sharing what with whom, over 400,000 people is a, is a very big task. Yeah. But if you said, I want to take this DLP engine and I want to fingerprint important sensitive customer information, maybe some DI data, or important financial information, and that document moves and it moves and tries to move external to the organization, I want to know about that specific event and I want it to go ahead and go down to a Splunk or go down to an arc site to a red team that's going to look at that and say, I've got a data exfiltration based on the characteristics that we've set. I want to know about that one. This becomes another feed to that big picture. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So CASB should tie into other reporting and analytics. We'll pride ourselves. Um, I'll shameless plug for Mac. Is the ability before Mac be acquired us, we plug into, we still do, we plug in the checkpoint, we plug in the force points, we plug in the blue codes. So we can use a variety of different feeds, and we can also take those feeds and, and, and uh, integrate with other solutions to provide that type of visibility. So that is very important from a CASB perspective. Good. Thanks, sir. Any other questions you guys have? I'm just going to run you through a couple. I apologize. What could, what could be here? But I'm going to take you through a quick demo to provide a little visibility, number one, into shadow IT. Risk. What's the risk associated with people utilizing particular services? And then I'm going to also talk about, let's, let's drive into an individual user and see what services those users are to provide visibility. So at a minimum, any CASB that you pick, whether you're picking a McAfee solution or a force point or a Symantec or somebody else, it should have these bare minimum requirements for a <laughs> so, at a minimum, when you log in, so these are some of the types of events. So this would be 
I log in, these are the events since I last time logged in. So providing some good, nice analytics as to what's changed in the environment since I've, I've gotten there. But let's talk a little bit about services. So this is, talks about the unsanctioned or the shadow type services. So in this environment, we have cataloged over 2,350 services. And this is very, very typical to what we see inside of a, an organization. Now, a shadow IT or the governance angle of it is that you should be able to look on all of these services and provide a risk score. So CASB should tell you that an application is, is good or it's bad based on a certain criteria. In this case, I've got green, yellow, I might have a red somewhere here. I've got red. So let's take a look at a red. What compromises a red? So when you utilize a CASB, you look at the risks associated, what are the pros and cons? How many users do I have using this particular service? What's the data? How much data has moved inside of that? And how much data has been uploaded and exfiltrated out of your organization? So when we take a look at this particular product, you're going to see where is it housed. It's housed in the United States. The CASB should tell you what's the risk, and the risk could be based on categories. So in this case, we've got data sharing, we've got encryption, desktop application. So inherently, it's a, it's a very risky thing. Why? Because it shares files. What else is risky is what type of uh, encryption does it have? Encryption strength of rest? Well, in this case, it's got none. Um, so there's a variety of different things that play into this business. Who owns the intellectual property? Auditing, geography, GDPR. How many folks are impacted by GDPR here? How many folks would want to know if customers or, or people inside your organization are utilizing a service that doesn't adhere or hasn't been recognized as adhering to GDPR? A lot of money if you get caught, right? So a CASB should provide those, those analytics to a service and should be recognized by a CASB. So how do you do that? Go on the service and let us fall the So, we'll, so we, we'll, we'll take a look at their, their ULO. So you dive down into the, their ULO, their analytics, and then you've got either um, sending them uh, email or Federal Express or picking up the phone and calling and asking for their most recent updated terms based on GDPR. What's their GDPR statement? If they don't have a good one, then you'd be able to come back and say, hey, you don't know about this, and so we're going to categorize <coughs> We catalog over 30,000 of these services, so we've got, there's quite a few people that do this, and we add anywhere from probably about 100 a month. So if we're not mistaken, wasn't that what Sky High did before? That was Absolutely. In San Francisco, we actually used Sky High. Yep. Yeah, as sort Still of, do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Some are. Cloud remediation team, like, hey, let's first pass. Does it pass the Sky High sniff test? If not, then we sort of dig down and stuff. But I, I remember that being for like, yeah. more comments. It's good stuff. Yeah, it's, it, this provides the visibility to the unsanctioned and sanctioned services that people right. use. Right. So, so you're looking across multiple CSPs and multiple services, and how are you aggregating that data? Are you coming from endpoint reporting itself, or is it through some sort of centralized proxy, or how is this? Yeah, I apologize. I don't have the, the architecture, but I whiteboard I do it. But essentially, what we're getting this information from is we're getting it from either a firewall or next generation firewall, or a proxy type device, or from a SIM, right? A SIM is a, is a cataloging of a variety of different tools. So we can actually consume a feed from there. We get the feed, we run it through a parser, and we're actually looking at the data that we just need to look at. Now, a CASB should, so once again, we live in the cloud. Your data should stay on-prem. So if you're looking at a CASB, make sure that they're tokenizing your data, right? So they're gonna look at your IP addresses, your usernames, important PI data that's sensitive to the organization. And if you can have a cloud-type service where a CASB consume that, they're gonna consume up in the cloud, make sure that that information is tokenized on-prem, which means that when it gets to the cloud, a guy like me that's working in customer support, you call in and say, hey, I need you to work on my tenant. I log into your tenant, I see hash values. I see encrypted hashes. Now, the guy on-prem that I'm working with, he can actually see usernames, IP addresses, because he's got the ability to detokenize that data and look at that data in real time. So that's a big important thing, is that any kind of CASB that's going to get this type of sensitive information, you want to make sure that that doesn't need the organization itself too. So I mentioned GDPR just because it's easy. It's a big, it's a big buzzword right now, yeah. this, this particular service. Now, I can look into usage. This is always a pretty telling one. This, this is one who's the top user. What, use, what group is that particular user associated with? And 
you know, when in this data leave the environment. In this case, it's David Carter. So I could click on David Carter. Now it pops up David Carter and says, all right, I'm looking at David Carter with sense, sense space, but I'm going to go ahead and eliminate that. I'm just going to David Carter. Now I look and see David Carter is using 269 services. None of those, how many are high risk? So now I get into a different characteristic based on the individual user. So this is pretty compelling, and this is what it has to be the data that it should provide to you. Kind of makes sense? Kind of important information you'd like to see and learn about? It's always exciting when we go in and do a shadow IT audit with folks, and they want to get to this screen, and then they figure out it's some of the biggest abusers of the people on the IT team. <laughs> um, you'd also be surprised as how much YouTube, Netflix, and a variety of other non-essential services in the, in the terabytes over a certain period of time are exchanged and, and we get visibility into it. So it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. So that, that screen is just showing the using the service. It doesn't necessarily say that they're, they're using the data on this. Correct. It's just saying I've got a number of uploads to a particular service. Now, the shadow IT will tell you, well, that's a risky service for that person to be using because of this criteria that we baked on. It's not going to tell you what type of documents those are. So that was my next question. Um, is it capable of reading if it's a document, let's say, the metadata properties of that document? Depends if you're using a proxy. So that, that what you just described is a forward proxy use case in some aspects. Um, so our solution, if you're using a sanctioned solution, can actually look at that data. So you want to do unstructured, structured, structured, fingerprinting, yes, absolutely. If it's a tier one, we can actually take a look at that. But if someone is using their own personal Dropbox account and, they're, and you're allowing them to upload and download to that particular service, our CASB won't do it. Okay. You need actually a, a proxy, something that's going to digest that and provide in that DLP instant. That's something usually done on, on site. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Basically, yeah. yeah. Exactly right. Yeah, versus one is end, uh, end destination. Now, if we've got it, I don't want to do a plug for us, but we have strong, deep, rich ties via API to like a OneDrive or to a box or a Dropbox that if someone takes that document, number one, we can prevent them from uploading that document into it. We can prevent somebody from downloading uh, that document, but we can prevent that document from moving laterally in the cloud, too. That's all done on rich APIs without a proxy. The question I is, is that will cover the corporate problems. Exactly. But not the personal account or another decision to have the own problems. Yep. So that's to be careful what you wish for. Yeah. Because once you know about it and see it on a personal, then you're responsible for it. Real big thing, the real big issue for that is in the government. Government sometimes doesn't want to know about that personal Dropbox that's processing, I don't know, images and things that you don't want to see. What you do want to see is that they're using Dropbox as a service and shut it down. So you want to shut down the unloaded use it's not sanctioned. Yep. Exactly. I think we've got we've let our we've let the users figure out all these different services that they want to use, and we've permitted it for so long that now we've got data that sits everywhere. One of the biggest requests we get for is how many are in Office 365? Lot. How many got there a year ago? Two years ago. How many have no idea what what kind of documentation is up in OneDrive, for instance, over the past two years? So can you do an on-demand data scan for PIA that PII data is sitting inside of a service like Office 365? And that's what it has we should be able to do. Um, that's a scary venture sometimes for folks to figure out what's their exposure there. Um, but what we like to do is say, you know what? Why don't you categorize? So a real good way to come back to the business and say, well, the reason we're shutting these services off is because these services are risky to the business. So a CASB should be able to categorize the services based on risk. So we're going to go ahead and permit file sharing. Let's go back to the example of We're going to permit people to use services from, say, 2 to, I don't know why I just think of that real quick. This is your white is essential. Yes. So what you can do is, is I can set up, maybe from a file sharing perspective, I'm going to allow 2, 3, and 4 file sharing solutions to work. You can go ahead and work because 
based on the risk, they're, they're less risky than say five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And remember I said there's about 4,000 file sharing solutions that are out there today. As a new one pops in, let's say we give that, or the CASB provides that a risk of seven. Well now if you're basing the use of a service based on the risk to the business, which is pretty important, not permitting the, the user to go to that service and willy-nilly they, they get it. Now what a CASB should be doing is monitoring all of these new file sharing solutions that are out there providing a risk, and then your firewalls or your proxies should be able to ingest those service groups or those categories into it to provide that blocking mechanism, if that makes sense. Another good thing for a CASB to do is to be able to compare services. So this is more or less a, uh, let me do this real quick. Trying to get some guys together.
So a CASB should be able to look out at multiple services on the fly. So I'm going to go ahead and add, this isn't my tenant, so I'm not going to add anything. <laughs> Otherwise, they'll kill me. But you should be able to add services for the same policy, same plot, same time, and apply. Um, another way that you should implement a CASB, so we have very, very tight, rich um, APIs for organizations, so like OneDrive, so we can do DLP via an API connection. Another way to do DLP is through a proxy type or a proxy, reverse proxy type, type thing. So all APIs are not created equal. So that's another thing is that you might have API connectivity or we may have API connectivity with a particular vendor, um, but it's only for user behavior analytics. So the user went there, he spent some time there, the data went up and down, but you don't have DLP because that particular vendor doesn't have a DLP API for us to write to or for anybody else to write to. So that's something to also consider when you're looking at rolling out sanction services. What's the API capability of that particular vendor? Any questions? Yeah. Sure. Um, the DLP policy that I have is like if the sky high version of the exactly is a DLP product. Correct. So we have a commonality, so you're probably very familiar with EPO. Yes. So right now our incidents can go down to EPO. But the but same the policy, DLP. the policies are not created yet. Yeah. That that integration is not there yet. But the fact that we can have incidents, so if somebody were to, to move a document, say in Office 365, and they had a McAfee tag or a Titus tag, or, or we can actually, that, that incident can actually be charted down into EPO as an incident. And then we provide that link to this dashboard that if you were to click on that incident, it would open up that incident inside of our dashboard. So that's the integration point as it stands today with uh, EPO from that perspective. But not one, con not one console yet. Yeah, um, I think one of our our biggest competitive advantages is that not only we, we plug in a McAfee, but we can also integrate with a Force Point via ICAP. Um, we also integrate with Symantec, even though I don't like to say that, but we, we do. Uh, McAfee as well. In fact, we integrated with McAfee before McAfee integrated with us, so to speak. So um, when we got acquired, the third probably statement out of Rajiv to one of our co-founders was that. In order to be a CASB, you've got to be flexible. And you have to have the ability to, good, bad, or indifferent, to plug into competitive situations and competitive products. So. Yeah, can you explain the other configuration? Because I have still has. So usually you Well, I probably made an error in saying I have my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> but only a few of the other units will supply. Well, what we would do is we would leverage your on prem DLP. So in other words, an incident takes place in the cloud, we're going to send that incident down to the, the DLP solution that's on the network, and we're going to provide the visibility there. So you guys tell us what to look for. We'll tell you that there's an incident, and then we'll tell the incident down to the, the on-prem DLP engine. So we're not writing our rules. We're, we're actually using the rules that are on-prem to dictate what happens in the cloud in, in layman's terms. So I'm not an expert in that area. So from a pattern matching perspective, let's say if I worked in an enterprise that had a lot of really different kind of PII, PCI, and PAN, not PCI, PAN, different kinds of account numbers mm -hmm. that we really wanted to monitor, um, would you allow me to create my own regex here? Or my Absolutely, own your own regex. So you've got your own canned ones that say, hey, this is a US social security number. Absolutely. Blah, blah. But if you want to write your own, create push your regex here. Absolutely. Now it's really cool. Yeah, um, I wish Will was here. Will's got a, a demo over, oh my gosh, he took all the census data and he looked for specific fields inside the census data. You can imagine 300 and some odd million people. And he takes a, a sample in that big data set and he's looking for eight characteristics. And our search comes back in less than a quarter of a second on a DLP violation based on a regex, you know, looking for certain, certain fields inside of that thing. That big of a data set. Yeah. So I'm trying to imagine, like, so we got S3, you got maybe people doing SFTP up to EC2 instances, whatever it may be. These are encrypted. How are you, is it through some sort of proxy that you're 
decryption that and then you're able to look at DLP or are you relying so, on that endpoint? So infrastructure as a service is going to be a little bit different. People would utilize our CASB to like take a look at their Azure instance or their AWS instance. And so what we do is we will do benchmarks, the CIS benchmarks against both of those services. And we're going to look at, number one, do you own the accounts that, are, that exist? So we'll do an inventory of all the accounts that say, for instance, you have them in AWS. Do they, at a minimum, those accounts have the right security metrics that we've defined? And then we're going to look for unencrypted S3 buckets. You know, are those buckets exposed? How many have heard of the S3 unencrypted buckets that are trying to and go, Do a Google search on unencrypted S3 buckets and see what companies have been bit by that. What that is is they have a group of developers that have taken sensitive customer data, stuck it up in the Amazon, and left it unencrypted. So, and they're working on their own project in the cloud and not weary that somebody's able to access that data externally inside of AWS. But it's a, it's a a possible DLP external channel also. Absolutely. And so, I mean, you, you can report on it, I guess, but you can't see in it. So we have the ability, our, I don't want to do a plug for our solution, but our solution is the only solution to apply the same DLP policy towards Azure. So looking at the blob storage, I think that's the term for Azure, and also with the AWS, provided that it's, it's not encrypted because you can't do DLP against an encrypted unless you have the ability to decrypt it, look at it. But we can actually do on-demand scans inside of those services looking for sensitive documentation, provided that it's not encrypted and that we can look at it. Yeah. It's a good use case for a and, and you mentioned tokenization earlier. Is, is that a requirement, or is it tied to something specific to your tool, or is it kind of your tool agnostic to whatever tokenization that you might be doing and trying to see if there's been a lock-in or anything like that? Well, with tokenization, what we're concerned about is housing your data up in our cloud. We don't want to have any part of your data. So the ability to do tokenization is that the token remains with you. You've got the ability to detokenize on site. And then the information that's shared with us up in the cloud is tokenized. So basically, is that customer driven or is that something specific to your implementation about how it's done so that one day if someone decides to move away from your product, that the tokenization is not locking them into your particular product? Yeah, because you have the ability to detokenize that so you can take it and run with it however you, you want. We, we don't want your customers, we don't want your data in our cloud. That's really our metrics, it's not doing any kind of vendor lock-in. Uh, we're really just consuming a feed from your firewall. And that's happening all the time, so we're not doing anything to your data. You, you still own the data, the firewall's still running, you still got logs, the logs are just being set to us for consuming the logs, but those logs, same logs are probably going to a SIM, so you're, you're, none of your information is actually leaving the environment, we're not doing anything with it. So. We're not in line, so if we were to die. You're not actually doing any of the mapping associated with the tokenization. You're just, yep, you're just not seeing it. So that's all I have for you guys today. <laughs> Apologies about Will, but uh, I tried my best.